Good morning. It's good to be with you again this morning. And over recent weeks, as you know, we've been looking at what it means to be church. And I was thinking that I think the honest reality is that our church at Cleveland Salvation Army will look different when we begin to meet together again, because we are different people um, than we were before and things have changed um, since we last met. Uh, and, and so I, I guess we need to ask ourselves the question, is that going to send us into some kind of spin? Is that going to be traumatic for us? Um, or are we excitedly awaiting what God has in store for us as a core? Are we going to look forward, taking into account the things we have been looking at in Scripture over the last few weeks? Are we going to make Cleveland Core a place where Jesus is the centre of us? Are we going to be inclusive of everyone regardless? Are we going to make prayer an essential part of who we are as a church community? Are we going to use our traditions in a positive way, particularly the traditions of scripture reading and working out our faith together will we exhibit the fruits of the spirit in our church community will we use our giftings for the benefit of the whole church um, not hiding them because we haven't got the confidence to use them and i'd like to add that to that another question this morning whose church is it anyway and we are going to look at a Bible passage this morning, which will answer that question. And in fact, this passage is the first time that the word church is mentioned in the Bible. Um, and do you know the Bible reading? Do you know the passage I'm talking about? It's actually Ma Matthew chapter 16. And we know that this passage is really important when discovering what church is for two reasons. Firstly, that the first time church is mentioned, the words come out of Jesus's mouth. So anything which Jesus, is said, Jesus says is important. And the second reason is that it's the first time church is ever mentioned in scripture. And we always know that the first time a word is used, got real significance, is really important um, message about the subject. So let's read together from Matthew chapter 16. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea uh, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the key of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. I guess that people have many different ideas on church, and we've already discussed that a little bit um, over the past weeks. And these ideas can be based on their religion or on their denomination. It could be based on history, and there's a long, complicated history of the church a lot of it um, not necessarily very good it can be based on traditions um, some people may be, be attracted to church the actual church building because of its architecture or um, because of the historic content which is in it um, some people may describe um, it the church is a place where people go on a Sunday Christians go on a Sunday to worship some may see the church as a really good place for social um, celebrations like funerals and, and christenings and marriages, that kind of thing. 
some people may see it as a really good place to send their kids for an hour or so on Sunday so that they can have some peace and quiet or to attend a toddler group or a lunch club. Some people may see it as a good place to get some kind of help like food parcels. And some people may describe it as a group of Christians. So they may focus more on the people than on the building. But let's go back to that Bible passage and take note of the sequence of events um, in this sto story to try to understand the significance of them. And when we do that, the first thing we notice is um, that Jesus led his disciples away from Jerusalem to Philippi. And that's important to notice because, as you know, Jerusalem was the center of religious worship um, for the Jews. It's a place where they went to worship God, the, the physical space, which was so spiritually important to them. And people would travel many, many miles for important religious festivals there um, at the temple or, or just to go and see the temple and worship and offer sacrifices at the temple. But Jesus led his disciples away from that physical space when he wanted to talk to them about building a church. And then the next thing we noticed in this passage is that Jesus asked them an opening question um, to understand their, uh, to get them thinking about this subject. And he said to them, who do people say that I am? What are, what are people saying about me? And this was done not in the kind of way that is sometimes done because Jesus was needy and needed to get some kind of affirmation about who he was or because he wanted to know if people were talking about him behind his back. Um, it was just a way of getting people, the disciples to think about who he was and what people were saying about him. And the disciples told him that People said that he was probably one of the great prophets from the past. So John the Baptist from the recent past or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other um, dead prophets. But they couldn't have been further from the truth um, when you think about it. And that's what makes this part of the dialogue so significant. The general population thought that Jesus was like a dead man one of the dead prophets but when Jesus asked his disciples so who do you say I am Peter was right in there straight away with the answer you are the Messiah the son of the living God this dialogue took place towards the end of Jesus's ministry on earth and the disciples had been traveling with him and living with him for quite some time at this point so they knew him better than most Peter doesn't give the most popular answer. He doesn't think about other people's opinions and go along with that. Peter shows that he has really thought about this subject, not necessarily on a brain level, but on a deep spiritual level as well. And Peter shows that he hasn't only engaged with Jesus the healer, Jesus the teacher, Jesus the revolutionary. He has engaged with Jesus, the son of the living God. His eyes and his ears and all his senses um, has witnessed that what Jesus could do, but his soul and his spirit were open to what God wanted extra, what God wanted to teach him and what God wanted to reveal to him about who Jesus is. And most of us, I'm guessing, who's listened to this morning, have been taught right from an early age that Jesus is the Son of God. But Peter hadn't had that kind of teaching. Um, he hadn't been taught that by his parents or his Sunday school teachers like we had. He'd been taught that by God himself. That's how that was revealed to him because it was, it was just what wasn't known at that time. Nobody thought that at that time. And even to those of us who have been to church the whole of our lives and been taught that right from the very early childhood, there comes a time at some time in our spiritual journey at whatever age when we need God to reveal that to us or we need to accept 
God's revelation of that to us so that we know not only on an academic level but on a spiritual level that Jesus is the Son of God and the best Sunday school teacher in the world couldn't teach that to us that's a lesson that needs to come from God and then comes the climax of the story not written in a dramatic way but in this really calm strong way with huge significance for the whole world not just then but now Jesus changes Simon's name to Peter and that often happens in scripture um, when God got a really important mission to send someone on he very often changes their names they become different people and names were really insignificant in those days of who a person was and so his name becomes Peter which means the rock and when you look at his old name, Simon, that means flat-nosed. So who would want to call themselves flat-nosed when you could call them yourself the rock? That's so much more of a cool name than flat-nosed. But it, had, it wasn't just the name, it had, it had real meaning to it. And this new name of Peter, Peter was hugely significant for the rest of history. And Jesus tells him why. Peter, according to Jesus, is going to be the rock on which I build my church. That's the important bit. So God revealed Peter to Peter who Jesus was. And Jesus revealed to Simon who Peter was by changing his name. Peter is to be the rock. That's who he was. And on that rock, Peter, Jesus is going to build his church. Don't skip over those words because those five words, I will build my church, are the words which are the most significant to us this morning. In fact, those are the words most significant to the whole church today. It isn't Peter who's going to build the church, it's Jesus who is going to build the church. But he's going to use G Peter as part of his plan. But Jesus' words are plain, I will build my church. Peter's going to play a significant part, uh, according to the leading of the Spirit. The Spirit led Peter to, to do amazing things in Jesus' name. But it was the Holy Spirit at Pentecost who just brought the power so that thousands of people got saved on that day and the church was born. The other thing we mustn't pass over in those five words is Jesus said, I will build my church. It's the most smallest word, it is, that's not very good in English, it is the smallest word, the most important word there. I will build my church. And I guess for many of us, Clevedon Salvation Army, or whatever core or church you belong to, is important to us. And so we naturally feel ownership for it and call it my core. And that's quite a natural thing to do. To say the Salvation Army is my church or my core is a bit like saying the house I live in is my home or um, the people we're related to are my family or the police, people who are closest to us are my friends. It's not saying that we own them, but it's saying we somehow belong together. We've got strong connection um, with each other. So it's a good thing that we call the place where we worship our church or our core because it speaks about this deep connection both with the people who worship and, and celebrate Jesus there with us but also with Jesus himself um, because it's their core, it's my core, it's Jesus' core. And when Jesus said build my church though, he meant to build the church which he will design, which he will develop, which he will lead, which he will be the head of. And in the same way we say my church to a group of people who um, we are connected with, saying my church makes us connected to Jesus and his plan and says that we want to be part of that. To think of the church belonging to us in that we develop it and we design it and we control it and we are the head of it is, is a really dangerous mistake to make and uh, unscriptural too. Maybe, and that's why so many churches are empty today and so many people are against former religion. 
And you know, you speak to young people today and they are so spiritual. They are so looking for something on a deeper level. I think young people today think really, really deeply. And yet many of them don't want to be involved with formal religion of any kind. I don't know, maybe that's because we have made the church ours instead of allowing God to make the church his and being the rock of Jesus's church for him. Maybe it's only when we accept that the church belongs to Jesus, that the purposes of Jesus are, are secured, that we can begin to move forward and truly get an understanding of what church really is. It is only when we humbly accept that we are the rocks on which Jesus is going to build his church that we become the community which Jesus has called us to be. Maybe we need to stop thinking that the officer needs to do this to, to bring the numbers up in our core or that the children's workers need to do that to encourage children into the core or the core council or the section leaders should should do whatever to improve our course core maybe i'll just put this out there maybe we should start saying my name is peter own it my name is peter the rock on which jesus is going to build his church Maybe we should say, my name is Peter and I will do amazing things for God because I will follow him where he leads me. Maybe when we say my church um, and part of our ownership of that my church is what is Jesus going to lead me into doing for my church? How is God going to edify the church using my giftings, using my calling? using my knowledge that Jesus is the son of the living God. Let's sing together. Father of creation Unfold your sovereign plan Raise up a chosen generation That will march through the land All of creation is longing For your unveiling of power Would you your anointing. Oh God, let this be the hour. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go.
Shall we pray? God Jesus, I just pray for um, the community of people who watch these messages week after week. And God, as we have a core council meeting this week to discuss um, the way forward for Clevedon Salvation Army with the um, idea of opening up uh, our building quite soon, we just pray that we will remember that, that it's your church and that we will follow your ways. So, um, God, I just pray for each individual watching this this morning and just pray that you will really bless them over this coming week. Amen. Amen, everyone. And I will see you next week. God bless. <laughs>